Hi, I'm Wanda Urbanska. You know, one of the places we Americans have always looked for a simpler life is on small, independent farms. Frank Levering and I did that here at Levering Orchard in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. That was over 20 years ago. This cherry orchard has been in Frank's family for a century now, since 1908. Small farms are as American as, well, cherry pie. Several hundred miles from here, at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson wrote, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. Jefferson's vision for the new nation was a patchwork of small farms. Farmers, he believed, were independent on their own land and vested in that land. That made farmers the very backbone of the fledgling democracy he helped create. Cinder Stanton is Shannon's senior historian at Monticello. I spoke with her on the lawn at the University of Virginia, surrounded by buildings Jefferson himself designed. Basically, his, his idea of uh, a nation of, of small farmers came out of his reading in the Roman writers, people like Virgil, Virgil's Georgics, very much influenced his view, Virgil's Agricola, an industrious, independent, and virtuous farmer. And this is exactly what Jefferson saw in the United States, the possibility for that. Today, Jefferson's vision may seem to some of us quaint, kept alive mostly by folks like the Amish and by the heirs to the Back to the Land movement of the 1960s and 70s. Still, we love the idea of small farms. We want to believe that there will always be places where kids, animals, and fresh, healthful food converge, where life is simply good. Now, with all the romance many of us find in small farms, the financial reality is they very much need our help and our support. Small farms are vanishing before our eyes. During the 1930s, fully 25% of our population lived on farms. Now it's less than 2%. Since 1910, America has lost two-thirds of its farms. And since the 1980s alone, we've lost 300,000 farmers as farms become subdivisions. Which begs the question, will the day come when we no longer have enough farmland to meet our needs? And there's another problem. Increasingly, agribusiness, not small farmers, brings the food to our table. Francis Moore LaPay is best known as the author of the best-selling book, Diet for a Small Planet. Now, our food system is highly concentrated. There are 10 food corporations that control half of the food products. If you walk into the supermarket and see 30 or 40 food, 30 or 40,000 items, Half of them are brought to you by 10 corporations. Taken together, farm loss and the rise of agribusiness pose mortal threats to small farms. But there are things we can do to help keep small farms alive, choices we can make that really help. When I start thinking about what I put into my body and who grew it and how was it grown, was it a local farmer? Was it a farmer with a, a family farmer? Was it uh, without chemi unnecessary chemicals that might harm th that person or me? Um, was it local so that it didn't have to use up tremendous fossil fuels to bring it to me? So that it's, it's connecting me with what I'm purchasing um, so that there's a real knowledge and consciousness of it, so that it's a shift in the relationship to it. To buy locally grown food whenever you can, but long distance food, if it's being grown by farmers responsibly vested in their land, does help preserve farmland by keeping those farmers in business. And support local ordinances that zone land specifically for farming that keeps farms in and development out. 
One enterprising couple that has made a go of small farming is Tenley Weaver and Dennis Dove, who grow organic vegetables on 30 acres in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. As much as they can, Tenley and Dennis farm the old-fashioned way, as with the lady, their Suffolk mayor. She's been probably my greatest teacher among the many mentors I've had and has been very calm and patient and always very willing for me. Um, around the farm here, she and uh, her son that I have over in the pasture there bring in all of our firewood for um, our winter heat and uh, do most of our cultivating and uh, picking up rocks and hauling of small children and training of interns and <laughs> many other things that demand patience on the part of a horse. So what does she take the place of in what would be considered a modern farm? Well, it, it, there are farms out there, many farms, that are solely horse-powered. Uh, we are not. Dennis's horses, actually, he has a, thir uh, a uh, herd of 35 of them under one green hood called a John Deere. Um, <laughs> I look at her as over and above rather than a substitution for. Um, our horses bring us manure. They bring us lots of pleasure and connection. They do most of our pasture mowing with the exception of weeds they don't like to eat. Um, I think that she is a tremendous benefit to the farm um, emotionally. And I found that I work best if I have hobbies within the work that I like to do. We call it plurk. <laughs> so when I'm out working with lady, I'm really plurking. And I, I get my, uh, my good times as well as getting some work done around the farm here. What is plurk short for? Playing and working. <laughs> okay. Tenley Weaver seems to have found what many of us only dream about, work she loves. Everybody knows farming is not a quick path to fame and fortune, certainly not the fortune part anyway. And uh, we have to look to get our reimbursement as farmers in other ways. Uh, one of the ways that's most dear to us is knowing who we're feeding, uh, seeing the lives of the people we're able to nourish. Now suppose you decide you want to actually be a small farmer. Get closer to nature grow some really good food, live that farming life. You know, two popular magazines look at farming and life in the country in fresh and inspiring ways, Mother Earth News and Grit. These and other magazines are published by Ogden Publications in the heart of the heartland, Topeka, Kansas, a farming hub if there ever were one. People like Hank Will, editor of Grit, can help you get your feet wet in agriculture. That's because this former biology professor is not only a part-time farmer, but comes from a rich agricultural background. Yeah, so my my great-grandfather, Oscar Henry Will, uh, moved to Bismarck, Dakota Territory in the late 1800s uh, and basically set up a nursery and seed business. Uh, he made friends. Uh, he had many friends among the American Indians uh, from around the area. Uh, the tribes were, were um, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara folks. And many of those people uh, gifted him with sacks of seed. Uh, they were farmers, uh, those folks. They were farmers on the Missouri River bottoms around Bismarck. And, and uh, they gave him all kinds of different seed varieties, which then he uh, developed by selective breeding uh, and just straight selection. I think we see many more people that have really no connection with the farm feeling the urge to actually either get into it or dip their toe into it or at least move into the country to be immersed in agriculture. The rural lifestyle or to me includes or, or might include somebody who, who does a little bit of farming uh, but farming perhaps because they want to, because it's fun for them. It, it, it's, it's something that they wish to do, not necessarily that they have to earn a significant component of their living from. One of Hank's jobs at GRIT is to help out those country newcomers. And we, we try to you know, help them out with tips on how to either attract or repel certain kinds of wildlife, depending on whether they like the deer to eat their hostas or whether they're trying to grow hostas deer-free deer or, or, or whatnot. So, uh, we include some do-it-yourself uh, tips, you know, how to build a barn perhaps, or how to do some fencing, uh, how to build a backyard barbecue, you know, anything that, anything that might help them enjoy their time out on the land. Now, if you really want that farm lifestyle without all the really hard work, 
I've got just the man who'll show us all how to do it. By day, mild-mannered Clark Kent, AKA Brian Welch, is publisher, editorial director, and frequently a contributing writer at Ogden Publications. But by the light of dawn and dusk and by weekend, Brian Welch is super farmer, with a little help from his friends like Rusty, his trusty sheepdog, or as Brian, who lives just outside Lawrence, Kansas, within sight of Kansas University, puts it. A couple of years ago, I uh, was asked by somebody whether living in the country was inconvenient, and, and I kind of laughed because we are just, I told them we're like two miles from the nearest Starbucks here. And he said, oh yeah, you're one of those cappuccino cowboys. <laughs> and after I winced, I kind of had to acknowledge, I, indeed, I, I am one of those cappuccino cowboys. And in fact, now we refer to our farm as Rancho Cappuccino. That's kind of our little nickname for it. Rancho Cappuccino, 50 Kansas acres where a man can have his cappuccino and drink it too. Where the donkeys and the sheepdogs play. Where never is heard a discouraging word about finances because Brian is the first to admit that he and his wife are lifestyle farmers, raising cattle, sheep, goats on a very small scale for sale as meat, along with donkeys, mules, chickens, they sell the eggs, and 50 acres of grass, and loving every minute of it. Well, I don't do much work, but what work that's we, the point. What we do, that's part of my, one of my, uh, yeah, one of my goals is not to do very much work. We have automatic waterers that have floats in them so that I don't have to uh, worry about whether there's water. If you know where they are, and if you know they have water, and if they eat grass, then your concerns are pretty well taken care of. Uh, and the animals are free to chase each other around and cause general chaos, <laughs> which is what we have here. There was plenty of and, chaos, all right. This but Brian, who started his career as a stand-up comedian, may be having a little sport with this notion that Rancho Cappuccino is a work-free zone. So do you come out and, and hang with your livestock every day? Every day. When you're home. Yeah, and that's the one thing, if you wanted to call it labor, the one thing you need to do every day is see them up close and see what's going on with them. What Brian's done made farming part of the art of living. Rather than of making a living, he thinks you and I can do too. But don't forget, lest you think I'm just visiting a petting zoo here, like other farmers, Brian is raising animals to sell for meat. So if you already have a rural property, you're thinking of having a rural property, and it's crossed your mind to have horses or something like that, well, you could think about having cattle or sheep or goats, and then you're utilizing the land in a way that provides some meat in a humane way. And in fact, you know, it has, has a sort of benign effect environmentally. Whereas the horse is just often just to look at, occasionally to ride once in a while. If you raised meat on your property, if you're comfortable with that, then that's meat that isn't produced in inhumane feedlots. It's meat that's not produced in ways that have profoundly negative environmental impacts. And in fact, most of the research is showing that it's a lot better for you than, than meat that's raised on grain in feedlots. And the animals are considerably healthier. I think that a vegetarian or a vegan lifestyle is a highly respectable, a uh, highly principled way of life. In my particular case, I don't think of it as more principled than the life of a meat eater. Um, and that's because I feel that no matter what our lifestyle, when we draw breath, being alive on the earth implies that other creatures lose their lives because we exist. In a soybean field, no wildlife lives, no animals live of any kind, virtually no insects. And so in these, in these pastures that you see all around you, there are, if, if you get down to ground level, there are thousands and thousands of living things in every little 10 square foot patch. So this is a very rich environment. It's a relatively natural environment and many living things earn their lives on this property. And we share our lives with them. For me, that engagement with nature on a very personal and on a very intimate level is rewarding personally. And I think of it as a, as a principled uh, way to live. 
To be principled, though, it helps to be practical as well, which is why Brian stresses the importance of automatic waterers and a good fence. Copy local folks who know what they're doing, he says, and for best range management, mix your animals. Plus, donkeys and mules protect the other animals against predators. You know, maybe Jefferson was right about the critical importance of small farms. And maybe we're beginning to realize we just can't afford to lose touch with that importance. We lost touch with that somewhat as industrial farming grew, as the necessity of having bigger properties, farming them with bigger equipment, uh, but that economic necessity came online. I think everybody realized more or less immediately, gosh, it would be terrible though, wouldn't it? to lose the tradition of small, independent, sustainable farms in this country. And a lot of people have devoted themselves, their lives, their passions, their money, to creating small, sustainable farms and supporting them across the country. You know, one of the freshest experiences in life is going to your local farmer's market and selecting farm fresh produce to add to your family's table. I'm not alone in that perception. To meet the demand, just in the past decade, the number of farmers' markets in America has doubled to nearly 5,000. And farmers' markets don't just provide great food, they offer the experience of community, as writer Bill McKibben told me. If you go to the farmers' market, studies show, you'll have 10 times more conversations in the course of your visit than if you're you know, wandering lonely through the aisles of the supermarket. Um, that's a big change, a big difference. Um, and so I'm very hopeful that these trends which are accelerating will continue. Farmers markets are the fastest growing part of America's food system. That's very good news. Farmers markets are also good news for small farmers like Dennis Dove, Tanley Weaver's partner at their organic vegetable farm. Farmers markets are uh, becoming a, uh, quite the thing. Every town needs to have one, and every kind of town seems to want one now. And this is encouraging more and more farmers to go back into farming. In our county, we have two or three young couples that have moved here uh, in, and are starting to farm in a determined way. And uh, we're, we're really excited for that, because part of what we want to do is spread the word about what we're doing. It's, it's a good life. It's a hard life, but it's a good life. And we would like to see young people get involved. And if there's not a market for them to sell their product, then the whole circle is, is broken. In the heart of Amish country is historic Central Market in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Linda Alecki is director of the local economy center in Lancaster and a regular shopper at Central Market. You know, farmers have been the backbone of this county for ever and a day, and I think that that supporting our small farmers in this in the heart of the city is really it's one of the most critical things that we can do to build a local economy and it connects the rural and the urban in ways that are very very profound cultural economic social um, Lancaster wouldn't be what it is if we didn't have our farmers a tradition of our farmers coming downtown to sell, sell. In a younger incarnation as a South Dakota farmer, Hank Will and his family were vendors at a Sioux Falls farmer's market. And it, it, was, a, it was a grand time. I mean, it was, it was fun. We went down, brought our wares to, to downtown Sioux Falls twice a week. Uh, our, our kids were involved. You know, they sort of got the idea of things you growing, having things that we grew having some, some monetary some value. value. I'm down here shopping this morning at the Greensboro Curbside Farmer's Market in Greensboro, North Carolina. Greensboro is lucky enough to have two farmer's markets, and as you can see, there are lots of vendors to choose from. Now, I don't know about you, but one reason I love farmer's markets is for the real tomatoes. Natalie Foster grows them. This ugly tomato here is uh, Cherokee purple, but Every year when we have tomato tasting contests, usually this one comes out in first place. And I love the diversity, not just diverse foods, but the cultural diversity. I was curious to know if other folks had other reasons for shopping at farmers markets. I asked Judy Harvey. 
Well, I like to know the people who grow my food. Uh, I look for the same people. The same vendors are here every week, and we have a relationship. And um, I feel like I trust the quality of, of their produce, and I really like paying them directly. Sarah Hannawald likes to bring Caroline and Juliana to the market. I like to buy organic and heirloom type foods, and it's a lot cheaper at the farmer's market than it is at the grocery store. For Jenny Olson, the market experience goes beyond food. Yeah, uh, it's very fulfilling to me. Um, there's something tangible about it and accessible, and um, it's very sensory. I mean, you can touch the food, you can talk to the people and hear their stories and get to know them, and they seem happy to see you. And it's a gathering place. I see a lot of friends, and so we, we have a chance to kind of catch up. So it feels it's a very much a community. Um, it's just fulfilling because you feel like you could go shopping and get that somewhere else, but you can come here and you can understand the stories and relate to the people who actually produce that item. Jerry Alfano has been the market's coordinator for seven years. Um, there's a lot of exciting things going on with the market. Um, we are getting younger people coming to the market. We are getting some younger farmers. We're getting more families with young children. And the market has always been a wonderful place. But seven years ago, we were really worried that both our farmers and our market customers were aging out. Jerry attributes those changes to growing public awareness of the health and environmental benefits of locally grown food. And here are a few tips to keep in mind while shopping at your local farmer's market. Hank Will says be sure you know what you're buying. The popularity of farmer's markets is, is such that there are plenty of farmer's markets in the country where you have to literally ask the individual that you're perhaps buying your spinach from, whether or not that's California spinach that they had trucked in in a case because they're out, or something that they actually produced on their farm. And there are plenty of farmer's market organizations, especially where they're more organized on the East Coast and the West Coast, where in order to be a member, in order to be able to sell there, you have to guarantee that, that it's, it's uh, food that you've produced yourself, that you're not just tapping into the wholesale um, vegetable market or produce market and, and supplying people through that. I asked Jerry Alfano about long distance food. Um, off season, we allow some of that just because we are a year round market. Um, we make that clear to the customer that that's what it is, but we do not sell, we never sell bananas or oranges or any of the things you cannot grow in North Carolina. Now, if you're buying directly from the farmer, don't be afraid to ask how that fruit or vegetable was grown. What were the chemical inputs, if any, and how often were chemicals used? And another thing, if you're looking at a group of, say, golden delicious apples, find out from the farmer which of them will have the best flavor. Apples of the same variety, like other fruits and vegetables, vary among themselves in taste and quality. More than anyone else, the farmer who grew those apples will know what's really good. And remember, to reduce your personal waste stream, always bring your own reusable bag. So, whenever you can, buy locally grown products and support a farmer's market and a farmer near you. Remember, nothing's too small to make a difference. Until next time, I'm Wanda Urbanska.